Hello, I'm Jonathan Tobin, Editor-in-Chief of the Jewish News Syndicate, JNS.org, and you're listening to Top Story, a weekly podcast where I analyze the most important stories happening in Jewish news around the world. Each week, I'll break down politics, foreign policy, and culture to provide insights into what is going on behind the headlines. This week, we're going to look at the surge in anti-Semitism we're seeing around the world. And we're going to discuss how and whether the organized Jewish community and its allies and governments have failed to confront and or answer it. Whether this is really just blowback from Israel's recent conflict with Hamas, or if there is something far more insidious and linked to popular culture and ideas that is fueling it, and why it is particularly coming up now. To discuss these issues, I'm particularly pleased to be joined by my colleague, Melanie Phillips. Melanie Phillips is a British journalist, broadcaster, and author who has championed traditional values in the culture war for more than three decades. She writes a weekly column for JNS and one for the Times of London and regularly broadcasts on the BBC. Her first novel, The Legacy, which deals with conflicted Jewish identity, anti-Semitism, and the power of history, was published in 2018, along with her personal and political memoir, Guardian Angel. Her previous books include her 2006 bestseller, Londonistan, which is a book that introduced her work to many in the United States, which is fabulous, about the British establishment's capitulation to Islamist aggression, and the world turned upside down, the global battle over God, truth, and power, published in 2010. You can follow all of Melanie's work, in addition to her JNS columns, at her website, www.melaniephillips.substack.com. Well, Melanie, thank you so much for coming on mm-hmm. Top Story this week. Welcome to the podcast, Melanie. Thank you so much for coming on. Hello, Jonathan. Very nice to be here. I guess, Melanie, um, in discussing anti-Semitism, I guess the first question we should address is why now and what is making this particularly acute at this moment in time? Well, obviously, the immediate uh, trigger for the unrest and the anti-Semitism was uh, the hostilities between Israel and the Palestinians, and in particular, the uh, Israeli uh, defense uh, of its people against attack in Gaza, which was represented as ever Uh, in the British and other Western media as uh, Israeli aggression and Israeli wanton child killing. Um, And um, why now is an interesting question. Uh, One has to ask why uh, the Palestinians behaved in the way they did now. Um, And I think that uh, these things are connected uh, because what clearly happened was a kind of coordinated strategy, it seemed to me anyway, uh, between what was going on in the Middle East, what was going on uh, in Britain and other Western countries, uh, including America, uh, because quite obviously uh, the impression that uh, was being created was that this was an assault on the Jewish people, um, an assault simultaneously on the Jewish people in Israel uh, through not just rockets, but even more important in a way than the rockets was the uprising, as it were, the coordinated uprising. Uh, by Israeli Arabs who had hitherto uh, been increasingly uh, uh, well adapted within Israeli society. There was tremendous signs of progress among them. And suddenly there were these horrific riots and attacks on Jews. And this was simultaneous, uh, occurring simultaneously with attacks on Jews as Jews uh, in uh, Western capitals. Um, And this was something quite new, in fact, that it was more brazen than hitherto. There was no longer uh, in the West, in Britain and elsewhere, no longer an attempt to pretend that this was against Israel. This was against Jews. They were hunting out Jews by name as Jews. And I think that this was part of a strategy. Um, uh, We can come on in a second to whose strategy it was. It's part of a strategy uh, to show that uh, the uh, Islamic world was now rising up against the Jewish people. Um, And whose strategy it was? Well, personally, I think that the hand of Iran can be seen behind this. And again, one has to go kind of, you have to take a step back to see what was going on in Iran. Um, Iran 
uh, brought to uh, near desperation, the regime was brought to near desperation by President Trump's sanctions becoming ever weaker, hanging on for the Biden administration, which the regime thought would actually um, pull its chestnuts out of the fire, uh, would actually rescue it. And the Biden administration, since it came into office, has given a series of signals uh, showing American weakness, giving the impression to Iran and to the Hamas, to the Palestinians, that if they want to attack either Israel or American interests, America isn't going to do very much. And simultaneously with this display of weakness, um, the Biden administration showed by a series of signals that it was kind of withdrawing love from Israel and therefore from the Jewish people. And all of this, I think, um, enabled or in incentivized the regime in Iran to use the Palestinians, to use the Hamas behind whom they are in Gaza, uh, training them, funding them, and so on and so forth, to use them as a kind of uh, proxy army uh, against the Jewish world and to activate, uh, as a result, not just uh, Hamas, uh, in Gaza, but to activate the Muslim world in the, uh, in the diaspora, as it were, uh, in the West, against the Jewish diaspora. Yeah, I think that's, that goes to a lot of important points. Um, and as you say, you know, we have to look back. Um, last year was the year of the Abraham Accords, and um, a realization that many in the Arab world, at least the Gulf states, were sick of being held hostage by the Palestinians and their intransigence, um, willing to normalize relations with Israel and normalize relations with the Jews, as we've seen with these events in Abu Dhabi and Dubai. And um, that there's been a pushback against this. Um, Iran certainly is a big piece of it. And the shift away from Trump's policies in Washington has certainly um, opened up and send signals, as you say, that um, the Obama project of realignment in the Middle East, of a rapprochement with Iran and uh, stepping away from attempts to contain it, which were successful under Trump, um, where Trump actually proved that Obama's uh, line taken up by the media echo chamber that supported the Iran nuclear deal, that the choice was appeasement or war, was, was false. Uh, Trump neither chose neither appeasement nor war. He chose containment. It was, as you say, beginning to work, working well, and then um, then things changed. With certainly in the United States with Biden, um, and it's interesting that that has had an impact on um, the Palestinians. It's had an impact on Israeli Arabs. Um, so take us into how that goes from. Well, there, there is a new realignment in, in process, mm. and then that then is the moment to start really turning a green light for anti-Semitism, which, you know, admittedly, that would not be necessarily what Joe Biden intended by, by his policy changes. But this is the natural effect, the series of events that were set in motion. Yes, well, there is another part of this um, horrendous uh, scenario which is the behavior of the uh, non-Jewish, non-Islamic world, certainly in Britain. I can't really speak for America, although some of this was happening in America, but in a rather different way, I think, from Britain. Uh, because in Britain, I think what, what sort of so completely shocked the British Jewish community uh, was not just the brazen nature of the um, attacks, which were principally, be, the, the physical attacks were principally being led by Muslims, by British Muslims, but in the most extraordinarily brazen way. So you had, you may have read about the convoy uh, of vehicles which drove down from the north of England to London and drove around the particularly Jewish areas of London uh, with, a, with guys in, uh, with at least one guy with a megaphone screaming abuse, Jewish, anti-Jewish, anti-Semitic abuse. Um, and this went on for, I think, four hours. Um, and there was another, even worse, in a way, uh, situation. There was one of the very many demonstrations against Israel that took place uh, in London, huge demonstrations. And on this particular occasion, near the Israel embassy in West London, uh, there was a particular Muslim who took uh, the microphone and started screaming incitement at the crowd 
uh, to, uh, to get the Jews, to get the Zionists that he wanted Jewish blood. Now, what shocked the Jewish community to the core was not just that these things happened so brazenly and without, as I said before, any fig leaf that this was anti-Israel, this was anti-Jew with absolutely no equivocation, but it was being done within earshot of the British police who stood by and did absolutely nothing. Now, subsequently, after there's a lot of furore in the press about all this, uh, the police let it be known that they were hunting down the guy who said he wanted Jewish blood. Well, I mean, that's really not the point, is it? Um, because, you know, the fact is that Jews could see, you know, that when somebody stands up and demands the murder of British Jews, the British police stand by. And what, uh, what has not been understood, I think, and still isn't understood, is that there is an unholy alliance. I've been writing about this for years. So have others. We have been completely ignored. The alliance between the left and the Muslims, or the left and the Islamists, let's say, because there are many British Muslims who don't go anywhere near this, who, you know, they just want to live a, a, an ordinary life. But there are enough Islamists, political uh, people who believe in political Islam, who are jihadis, who are fighting a holy war, a jihad. Uh, and they are in alliance uh, with the British left because they make common cause, even though their domestic social agenda is very different, quite obviously. Uh, the British left is libertarian and the Islamists are anything but, uh, but they're united in their desire to, um, to defeat the West, really. And they're united in their, in their belief that um, uh, the West has made victims, colonialist and imperialist victims of the developing world. So they make common cause. And they're united in their belief that behind the terrible West, behind the dreadful capital West of the Jews, and it's not just the hard left. I mean, British Jews have told themselves it was just the hard left. Uh, you know, under Jeremy Corbyn, as you know, uh, the Labour Party veered sharply to the hard left. And that's when we had this tremendous outbreak of uh, overt anti-Semitism, but it was masquerading very much as anti-Zionism, anti-Israelism. So it became very confused. But nevertheless, the British Jews told themselves, well, this is the hard left, this is Jeremy Corbyn. And they went to war, as it were, against Jeremy Corbyn. But that wasn't the point at all. Some of us have been trying to draw attention to the anti-Semitism uh, on the left, the fact that it was, being, it was, it was using anti-Zionism and anti-Israelism as a shield uh, for decades. And the British Jewish community won't even go there. They, they, they won't acknowledge that. So to them, um, uh, this whole terrible up, um, up, uh, upsurge in overt anti-Semitism enabled, as it were, by the British state um, has come as a terrible shock, uh, but not to some of us. Yeah, that's fascinating. To the extent that Americans have followed this issue as it has taken place in Britain, I think some of us who follow it closely understand what you've been writing about for years about this insidious alliance between um, elites, um, intellectual elites, artists, and Islamists um, enjoined in their hatred for the West and their contempt for Zionism. But many and many of those famous artists, you know, who sign these letters, who appear at these uh, uh, at these demonstrations have in the past gone out of their way to claim, well, this is not anti anti-Semitism. Uh, we're some of them are in are Jews and they're saying, well, we're not anti-Semitic. We're just against no, these right wing Zionists and awful Americans. Um, that theory has been exploded by recent mm -hmm. events in Britain as well as in the United States. How is how has that impacted that that alliance at all, if 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 at all if at all? Well, it's become much harder to maintain the fiction that there is this great division between anti-Zionism on the one hand and anti-Semitism on the other. Um, uh, but I, I think a lot of people are still deluding themselves because you see, just as with anti-Semitism in general, uh, for the Jewish diaspora, um, I think that the the uh, the implications of actually acknowledging reality are so shattering for their belief in the in the in the in the um, the lifestyle that they have created for themselves and what they tell themselves about being British Jews uh, that they are accepted um, and they cannot accept that that is not true they cannot accept that they will never be accepted uh, they tell themselves well 
this is just temporary. It's Jeremy Corbyn. It's a few Islamists. But we're okay. Nothing bad is happening to us. And it is often, and in this case, it is certainly the case now, but it's often very possible uh, for Jews to live perfectly comfortably in a society which is descending into the sewers of anti-Semitism, even quite violent anti-Semitism, and be quite insulated from it. Um, so it takes a lot to wake people up. And I don't think this is uh, happening yet, even though, as you say, it becomes much more it's become much more difficult to, um, to uh, separate it out. The point is that this is, has really bedeviled this whole issue, hasn't it? This confusion over what's anti-Semitism and what's anti-Zionism. And I've always taken the view that, um, certainly when it comes to Britain, there are many decent people who are not anti-Jew, I mean, there are some who clearly are, but let's 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 take it as for, for, uh, as read that there are many who are not, and yet they support this terrible narrative of lies about Israel. Now they do so largely uh, through ignorance, but what they don't understand, and what I'm afraid many Jews don't understand, is that there's a difference between the person and the thing. The person uh, uh, who signs up to this narrative may themselves be free of bigotry about, uh, against Jews. But what they're signing up to is a narrative which is fundamentally anti-Judaism. And that's because um, Jewish self-determination in our historic homeland, to which the Jews alone, uh, in which the Jews alone are the only extant indigenous people, and to which the Jews alone have the historical and legal right to any of it, uh, indeed to all of it, um, that fact is, is, is not understood and is indeed is denied. And consequently, even many Jews don't understand that if you deny the Jewish rights to their own homeland, you are denying something that is fundamental to Judaism and you're actually anti-Judaism itself. Now, people don't understand that because Judaism and Jewish history and the history of the Jews in the land of Israel is, is not only not understood by the vast majority of British people uh, who have never met a Jew in their lives and know nothing about Judaism or Israel, but it's not understood by many Jews either. Um, it's indeed not even understood by many Israelis, quite honestly. Um, and so um, uh, it becomes very difficult uh, to persuade people that these two things are linked in the way they are. And then the other thing that is not understood because it's never ever reported and the Jewish communities in both Britain and America never ever speak about this apart from one or two maverick individuals. Um, and that is Palestinian and Muslim anti-Semitism. Now that is endemic in the Muslim world into anti-Semitism. It was given a virulent, uh, it, it, is, it is based in theology. It was given a virulent uh, new uh, 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 lease of life and, and, uh, and, and a f uh, sort of fuel um, by the rise of Islamism, that is political Islam, jihadi Islam of the kind that we are familiar with, which actually grew up in the early years of the 20th century when the end of empire, the end of colonialism in the Arab and Muslim world was lifted, the Ottoman Empire uh, disintegrated. Um, and with the end of those chains of empire, um, Muslim, the, uh, Muslim radicals came forward and created what we know today as Islamism, the Muslim Brotherhood, um, and its equivalent in the Shia world, uh, in the Muslim Shia, in the Islamic Shia world. Now that fused theological Muslim anti-Semitism with um, Nazi and communist anti-Semitism. It drew quite heavily those ideologues of early Islamism in the early 20th century, Syed Qutub and others, drew very heavily upon both communist and Nazi ideology and communist and Nazi anti-Semitism. And so today's uh, Muslim world is infused by that. And when you look at Forget the Hamas. The Hamas are, you know, their charter is completely deranged in that they blame, it blames the Jews for every ill of the modern world from the French Revolution onwards, including the French Revolution. 
But forget the Hamas for a minute, the Palestinian Authority. Uh, does this. It puts out Nazi images, Nazi uh, style uh, imagery and medieval Christian imagery uh, to do with uh, demonic Jews. It demonizes Jews. It creates, it presents them as literally satanic and metaphysically uh, a cosmic evil. And, you know, on and on it goes. But people in Britain and America have no idea about this because no one tells them. The Jewish community won't tell them. And this is the great tragedy that we have, that for various reasons which we could talk about, the Jewish communities of the diaspora will not tell the truth about what we are all facing. I think there's so much in what you just said um, that is both true and, and really needs to be uh, unpacked. I think the um, both about the Jews themselves and about the environment in which they are living, um, I think one difference about this upsurge in, in the last month or two, which we, we has become so overt, and certainly in the United States from what went on before, has been the rise of the Black Lives Matter movement and the acceptance, certainly in America, uh, an American popular culture of ideas about critical race theory and white privilege which have really transformed the American political, you know, dis American political discourse and our public square, but had, I think for the Jews, um, not unexpected to some of us who have been seeing it all along, but to many, you know, well-meaning liberal uh, American Jews who wish to identify with anything that is seen as anti-racism and um, mm. sympathetic to minorities. Um, who embrace the idea, you know, of Black Lives Matter as, as an anodyne idea, which, mm. you know, no decent person should think that anybody, you know, Black Lives shouldn't matter. But that along with this, the, the baggage with it is um, an acceptance of intersectionalism and of ideas about white privilege, which identify not merely all Jews as white and therefore privileged and therefore oppressors who must apologize and give up their privilege, but also that the Jewish state is also white privilege, imperialism, colonialism, and an expression of white privilege, which is of course ironic and, and stupid because by the definitions of um, the people who talk about critical race theory, the majority of Israelis are themselves <laughs> people of color because they are from they, their origins are from the Middle East. But that's just another detail, like the history, that is of of no interest to not merely the ideologues that churn this awful stuff out, but which have popularized it. And this has certainly in America has manifested itself not merely in radical saying terrible things about Israel and Jews, but people in Congress, um, a, a growing wing of the Democratic Party that certainly putting it in the context of our discussion about Britain is in, a, in essence Corbynized, um, but uh, you know virulent in its own way with people like Ilhan Omar, Rashida Tlaib, Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez who are joining the demonization and who are not confronted by the moderates in their own party, let alone the Jewish community. And I guess my question is, how has this, you know, sort of BLM critical race theory, has it made the situation worse in Britain? You know, is it just what we're experiencing here, an echo of, of, of things that had already sort of uh, migrated into popular culture and seized hold of elites in Britain? It certainly uh, has taken hold in Britain uh, in the way that you say is happening in America. I can see it's happening in America, but, but less so. It's, it's more virulent in America. Uh, it's more virulent, it's more violent in America. Um, the Black Lives Matter, um, Antifa and all that, all those, you know, the riots that go on and on and on in Portland and, and, and elsewhere. We, we, we don't, uh, uh, mostly peaceful, of course, mostly peaceful, mostly, mostly peaceful riots. And mostly peaceful um, attacks. Um, so Britain doesn't really have that, but certainly this uh, idea that anti-racism, uh, that, that, that this idea that Black Lives Matter is anti-racist has taken hold among not just 
um, uh, the Jewish community, but, you know, uh, lots and lots of decent people in Britain because they, all, they want to be anti-racist. And because people are not generally ideological and they haven't got time or the energy or the, the interest to actually interrogate uh, the theory behind all these things, they don't realise that actually Black Lives Matter is a profoundly racially bigoted organisation which demonises white people and judges people on the basis of the colour of their skin, the very thing that defines racism. Uh, that's what Black Lives Matter is. Um, now, a lot of British people, British people really, really get that. They really understand that. But the trouble is that the people who are in charge of the culture, uh, not just the artistic uh, community, but people in charge of companies, uh, people in charge of uh, big charities and voluntary organizations, people in charge of, of museums, and crucially, the people running the universities and the schools have bought into this big time. And if anybody objects, and plenty do, um, you know, the price they pay is savage. They lose their jobs, they lose their professional standing, they are pilloried and stigmatized as racists. If you call out Black Lives Matter as being racially bigoted, anti-white, uh, organization which bring which 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 sets out overtly to bring down the West and is anti-Semitic to boot, you are called a racist. So we're living in this sort of Orwellian, it's a cliche, but like the best cliches, it's true, this Orwellian Kafka-esque uh, uh, nightmarish situation, uh, Alice in Wonderland, in which words are the opposite, have come to mean the opposite of what they actually are. So in Britain, we certainly have that. Um, but in Britain, there is something else, which I'm not sure whether it plays quite in the same way in America, uh, but it's very, very strong in Britain. And it's really played havoc uh, with all this in the same kind of intersectional way uh, as Black Lives Matter and the anti-racism agenda. And that's the Islamophobia agenda. Now, Britain has a, has, has a significant uh, Muslim community. And for years, uh, uh, this uh, uh, campaign to equate Islamophobia and anti-Semitism has been going. So every time the Jews of Britain point out the undeniable fact of the stupendous increase in attacks on them whenever Israel is in the, is in the news in a, in, a, in a disobliging way, and particularly in the last few weeks, um, suddenly, you know, the British Muslim community comes out and says, well, no, we, we, we've got it worse and produce alleged figures to show this. This is all complete nonsense, but nevertheless, uh, that's, what, that's what's said. Now, the really terrible thing is that the Jewish community in Britain not only doesn't say this is a complete lie, but actually is leading the charge in equating Islamophobia and anti-Semitism. Now, the two cannot be equated. Of course, there is anti-Muslim prejudice, just like there is anti-Asian prejudice, anti-Chinese, anti-Sikh. You know, all kinds of groups suffer from prejudice. No question, but that some people are truly prejudiced against Muslims. But the Islamophobia uh, canard, and it is a canard, uh, is that the, the, a category has been invented in order to protect from criticism, any criticism of the Islamic world. So any criticism of the Islamic world is deemed to be Islamophobic, including Muslim anti-Semitism. So if you call out Muslim anti-Semitism, you are Islamophobic. And the Jewish community has gone along with this. So this is a terrible confusion and paralysis. Now, why has the, British Jew why has the Jewish community in Britain gone along with this? Uh, various reasons, partly self-preservation, like, like so many people, if you, if you stand up against these orthodoxes, these intersectional orthodoxes, as I've said, you pay a terrible price, professionally and socially. But it's more than that. And I'm not sure, I, I, this, this plays differently in Britain from America, but it's basically the same thing. It's this terrible, terrible desire, not desire, this, this, um, this obsession, this, this, this neurosis, that the diaspora Jew has with fitting in. Um, they must be the same as everybody else. And because not to be the same as anybody as everybody else is dangerous. And it is dangerous, it's perfectly true. But the result of that is that they abase themselves. In Britain, they particularly abase themselves and always have done 
um, in order to try, you know, to keep their heads below the parapet. It's called Minhag Anglia, the custom of the English Jews, to keep their heads below the parapet in order to pretend that they are more English than the English. Um, and then everyone will leave them alone. Well, you know, for half a century after uh, the discovery of, of uh, the concentration camps and the Holocaust, uh, that actually worked. Anti-Semitism went underground. And the British Jews allowed themselves to believe that it was all over. Anti-Semitism was over. It was a thing of the past. And they were wrong. They were completely wrong. Now, some of us realized this years ago. I first realized it, long story, won't go into it now, uh, in the early 1980s. Uh, and in fact, I felt so terrible about it, I wrote a play about it, about how it was impossible to be a British Jew because you were torn between being British and being Jewish and they wouldn't let you be both. That's when I first really understood uh, what this was. And then, uh, again, long story short, in the year 2000, it became unequivocal. People were being, Jew uh, Israelis were being blown to smithereens uh, in Israel, where I am now, um, in buses and in pizza parlors. And um, uh, the Israelis, you know, had to stop it, obviously. Um, and so they had to deal with the radical elements in uh, what's called the occupied territories in Britain, what I would call Judea and Samaria. Um, and as a result of the condign action that the Israelis were having to take in order to stop themselves being blown up, which they still were in great number, out of the woodwork, almost immediately in Britain, came this demonization of Israel. Israel was presented literally as Nazis. Uh, the, the word Nazi was on everyone's lips. And not only that, but British Jews were accused of aiding and abetting these Nazi, these Nazi Israelis. And you had to kind of prove that you weren't like that by denouncing Israel. Well, I wasn't gonna be like that. And what happened to me uh, was that I decided at that point that we'd all be living in an absolute fool's paradise, what I kind of realized in the early 1980s, but hadn't done anything about. And uh, within a few years, I bought a place here in, in, in Israel, uh, where I am now, uh, because, you know, despite the fact that there are 150,000 rockets pointing at us from Lebanon um, under the aegis of Iran, I feel safer here than I do in Britain. Now, that's just me. Um, but you know, it is very, very difficult for diaspora Jews to actually internalize the terrible fact that wherever we are outside Israel, we will never be completely accepted. It's always conditional, always conditional on something. And I believe that American Jews have exactly the same neurosis, but have dealt with it in a quite different way, and it's taken a different form. Well, I think it is different. Um, certainly, uh, American Jews have a different status, different sense of identity than British Jews in terms of being part of the country. It is, you know, America is a nation of immigrants. Um, it, it, it's not quite the same thing. But what I think is similar is the way the organized Jewish world, in its embrace of universalism, in its belief rooted in American Jewish history that making allies with other minorities which is blacks, um, that that is the guarantee of freedom exactly. for Jews. And yeah. that embrace of their agenda um, and really former partners, because of the two part, you know, the two, the two sides are no longer partners in any real sense, that, um, that, that, that cause and anything that is identified with anti-racism is integral to Jewish identity. Um, that's why most of the organized Jewish world supports Black Lives Matter, um, in spite of the evidence of anti-Semitism, in spite of the embrace of anti-Israel invective and anti-Zionism, even by people who understand that anti-Zionism is, is anti-Semitism, but believe that that alliance is more important, that it is more integral to Jewish identity in the United States, as you know, in sort of liberalism equals Judaism, and therefore, you know, th this goes to a lot of different things. You know, you early on in one of your, the first things you said on this podcast, you talked about declining sense of identity. And of course, all of the demography, demographers and all of the recent studies show that the largest growing group of Jews within the Jewish community are people who, who are identified as Jews of no religion. 
Jews who have no sense of Jewish peoplehood, but you know, have some sense of being descended from Jews are not ashamed of it, which is different from, you know, an earlier era where Jews were ashamed of being Jewish, but which identify Judaism as just a form of social justice, you know, under the rubric of tikkun olam, if they, if they even know that, and um, not anything to do with Israel, not anything to do with Jewish law, with Jewish tradition. Um, but in terms of po politics, that makes them allies with people like AOC, with Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez and the radical left wing of, of the Democratic Party. But here's where the, you know, here's where the, 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 the inflection point comes, because at what, what is interesting, what is different from, say, the reaction to the 2014, Israel's 2014 war with Hamas, which was certainly criticized by the left, but did not have the same kind of traction in popular culture as the last month's fighting did with people, you know, the, the late night comedians, um, the, you know, the, yeah. you know the, the Daily Show on the Comedy Challenge channel, yeah. which, believe it or not, many, many people get their news from, many young people especially, which, where Israel is delegitimized and demonized. And that this is all of a piece with um, both the ideology that we've discussed and it's directly connected with violence in the streets of New York and in Los Angeles and other places in a way that is new and shocking to American Jews, yeah. or at least to the extent that they're willing to discuss it. Yeah. Well, social media has got a lot to answer for, hasn't it? Uh, in the sense that um, that's one of the big changes. You mentioned 2014. Um, since then, you know, uh, social media has just sort of taken off um, as um, uh, in terms of influencing people's political views and their their grasp on reality, really. Um, so that's that's you know that's that's one big change. Um, and um, but you know this is an incremental thing. It's been building and building and building. And this is you know it is a strategy. There, you know this is the, these are not sort of accidental things. And in terms of what's going on in the in the in the Muslim and Arab world vis-à-vis uh, -vis, um, the demonization uh, of Israel. Um, and and the, the the war against Jewish people, which is being more and more um, overt, um, so um, it's it's both new and old, uh, really. Um, but the um, I mean, what you say about the differences with America, with the, between American Jews and British Jews, is absolutely correct. British Jews have not embraced uh, 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 un liberal universalism as a religion in the way that so many uh, American Jews have done. Um, and uh, that is, that is um, uh, a big difference. But the crucial thing is, as you say, this idea of Jewish nationhood, because although it takes a different form in Britain, which as I say, British Jews have not embraced liberal universalism in the same way, um, part of the shock that British Jews feel about all this stuff about um, all, all the anti-Semitism that's, that's going on, and indeed uh, the, the 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 way in which the anti-Israel stuff ble has bled so obviously and so fast into anti-Semitism, into unequivocal anti-Semitism, is that they don't regard themselves as British Jews and the Israelis as being the same people. They don't regard themselves as being part of one Jewish nation. Now, that's a bit of an exaggeration. I don't wish to, to oversimplify what is obviously a very complicated situation because in many respects, you know, many British Jews are, you know, they are religiously observant and they understand what it is to be a, a nation. And, you know, that's, that's the religion that they, that they subscribe to. But in a more kind of sociological sense, they don't identify as a nation. Um, they, so, so it becomes a, it comes as a terrible shock to them. And there was an example of this recently um, uh, in in this current uproar. Various uh, uh, British Jews uh, were going around saying, "What's it got to do with us? You know, why are we being picked on? Uh, why am, why am, is my child being picked on at her school uh, and being arraigned for the crimes of Israel, so-called crimes of Israel?" when it's nothing to do with her. Well, that's not the point. You know, what they should have been saying as British Jews was, these are lies being told about us, the, British, the Jewish people, but they don't see it that way. It's 
why are they picking on us? Because they see themselves as having created this wonderful bubble in which everything is basically fine, were it not for Jeremy Corbyn, were it not for the Muslims. But basically, we're fine. But they're not fine. And, you know, diaspora Jews are never fine. Um, you know, they can make an accommodation. They, 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 they can find, a, a, you know, a politically congenial way of, of, of living. And that's great. And they can have, you know, a nice life uh, for a long time. But it's always conditional. Um, and I think, you know, the lesson of history is that we've, we've, that that's always been the case. I mean, you say, you know, American Jews are very um, more integrated because America is clearly a nation of immigrants. Um, and that's obviously true. And it makes it different again from Britain, which is an ancient, uh, an ancient society, an ancient culture, an ancient nation with a very strong sense of, a nation, of its nationhood, national identity and its culture and so forth and so on. But, I mean, I recall, this is, you know, when I was younger, hearing appalling stories of terrible anti-Semitism in America. Um, and, you know, I, I've, I've often heard these, the, these tales. Um, and so, again, you know, I think we are kidding ourselves if just for, you know, for a few years, a few decades, we find a congenial way of living uh, with the host community, which makes us feel that we're the same as it. Um, well, two things happen. Either we eventually become uh, horrendously disabused of that fantasy, or it stops being a fantasy and it becomes true, and we collectively assimilate and then completely destroy and lose our Jewish identity. And I fear that's what's um, happening to a lot of American Jews. Now, it's happening also in Britain, but not at the same rate and not for the same reasons. I, th I think that's that's very true. It's a very di two different. It's the same problem, but applied in two very different ways with two very different reactions. Um, you know, on the one hand, Americans, many, if not most Americans, in spite of um, attacks on our culture and history from critical race theory and the 1619 project from the New York Times still believe in American exceptionalism and sort of the the story of American Jewry and its success and its, its really unique success, its historic success is, is linked to American exceptionalism, that this is not like Europe. Um, and it's it's not clear whether that will ultimately prevail. We're, we're obviously in a in a cultural and ideological um, conflict, certainly in the United States, over the future of our culture, um, as exactly. defined. Um, and the outcome is, I think, very still very much in doubt. And I, I guess that's from from your perspective, that may sound optimistic, but I think there's still major elements of American society that don't want any part of this. And indeed, there is yes. a strong philo-Semitic and um, philo, you know, strong support for Zionism within is baked deep into the political DNA of America through the evangelical movement. Um, but the question is, is it possible? And I guess you can answer for Britain, uh, or at least try to answer for Britain. Is there, is it possible that there can be um, a pushback against this in, in the mainstream, in mainstream uh, culture? Um, after all, Jeremy Corbyn is gone. I mean, he's, he, he was defeated. Uh, for a variety of reasons, most of which had nothing to do with anti-Semitism and much to do with, with um, you know, leaving the European Union um, and other problems associated with the with the Labour Party. But um, is there any hope that in a country that is still governed theoretically by a prime minister who says he's, you know, friendly to the Jewish community, um, opposed to anti-Semitism, for a pushback against this in Britain and? You know, from from your perspective, whether this trend, even within American politics, can be can be uh, stopped and ultimately defeated. Well, in Britain, I mean, let's start with the British government, the current British government led by Boris Johnson. There's no question, but that uh, uh, this government and successive British governments, uh, under David Cameron, under Theresa May, um, have been incredibly concerned. Uh, that they may be losing their Jewish community. They, you know, they understand the value of the Jewish community. They understand the moral duty to the Jewish community. There's no question about that. Um, and you know, in the wake of the last few weeks of ghastly things happening, they've come out and said how, you know, how shocked they are and how they stand by the Jewish community and they won't have anti-Semitism. And that's all fine, except it's not fine. 
It's not fine at all because it's pious platitudes. They mean it. They really do mean it. But they don't understand what is going on here. They don't understand, for example, that in order to really defeat this, they have to get, they have to, they have to take on what's behind it. So if they really meant it, they would have to say to the Muslim community openly, publicly, in terms, stop it. You're leading this. We won't have this. This is anti-Semitism in your community. You are riddled by it. You have to get rid of it. And let's not have any more of this Islamophobia stuff when we say this. That's the first thing they've got to say. And the second thing they've got to say is that Israel behaves entirely legally. It's no use. I mean, people don't understand. The British are very fair-minded. The British believe in law, international law, justice, fairness, and so on. They really do. It's in their DNA. And they've been taught that Israel's on the wrong side of all these things. And one of the people who've, who's taught, well, one of the things, one of the, the bodies that's taught them this falsehood is the British government. British government says its official policy is Israel is in illegal occupation in the occupied territories, including East Jerusalem. Now, if you are telling the British people that the Jews are behaving illegally in Israel, what do you expect if at the edges, people start getting violent if they are emotionally invested in that story. It's ridiculous to stand up and say we're with the Jewish community, we're horrified by anti-Semitism and not say these things. So could it be turned around? Yes, it could. Yes, it could. But to, to do that, the British government uh, as, as, a, as a body, as a, as, a, as, a, as, a, as a class, as it were, um, has got to face up to the fissures in its own society, which go far beyond the Jews. You know, they've, they've got a problem uh, with el significant elements of their Muslim community they've, from which they've run terrified for two, three decades. So this is very difficult stuff. So when you say, can it be turned around? Sometimes I think absolutely not. And sometimes I think, yes, it could. Um, it depends what kind of mood I'm in. Look, before 2016, I thought it was all over for the West. As far as I'm concerned, the stuff about Israel and the Jews is intimately concerned with the onslaught against the West, against the, the idea of the Western nation state, against Western culture, against the biblical codes of morality and ethics which underpin uh, Western civilization and all of that. And I've been charting that for three decades and more. So uh, I took a very pessimistic view until two things happened in 2016. You'll know what they are. The first was the vote for Brexit and the second was the election of Donald Trump. Now, the vote for Brexit uh, was the British people turning around and saying, actually, you know, there are millions of us who want our nation back. We want to be able to govern ourselves in accordance with our own democratic values uh, based on our own culture that we identify with as our homeland, basically. So that's what it was about. Um, and everybody went, my goodness, where did that come from? Well, I knew where it came from. Um, so that was a source of great hope, because if Britain could recover itself as a nation, then maybe it would recover itself from this demoralization, uh, demoralization in every sense that had gone on, in my view, uh, since, the, uh, since the Holocaust. And then the, in America, the second shoe dropped with the election of Donald Trump. Now, you don't have to like Donald Trump to understand that what happened there was something very seismic in that the American people in their millions voted for that man because they were repudiating the, uh, the ideology which said American exceptionalism is something terrible and, uh, you know, we've got to tear America down. We've got to reduce its, 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 its impact in the world. It doesn't stand for good stuff at all. And that's what people were reacting against. So the same thing happened on both sides of, on both sides of the Atlantic. And I thought there's hope for both countries. Now, in the years since then, there's, you know, tumultuous things have happened and we are now where we are. Um, so, uh, and, it, and it's a mess, but I think what we can see on both sides of the Atlantic is that we are in an absolutely titanic struggle for the West, for the soul of the West, for the existence and, 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 continu and continuation of the Western nation state as, as, as a thing in itself, um, of its culture, of its traditions, of its, of its morality. Um, of, its, of its right to exist and to say proudly to itself, our values are better than people who don't have these values. We're not allowed to say that anymore. This is the fight that we're in. 
Um, and at the moment, the bad people are winning uh, because the good people are either, uh, 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 well, it's an old cliche again, but, you know, it, it, for evil to be done, all it takes is for good people to do nothing. And that's what's happening. Uh, good people are not just doing nothing. They're running uh, uh, in terror uh, from the scene of the crime. And they are allowing themselves to go along with it. So at the moment, the bad people are winning. Now, there are millions and millions of Americans who I'm sure are absolutely horrified by what's going on. All this inter intersectionality rubbish and so on. They can see exactly what's happening. Um, but... It seems to me they are, you know, they're disenfranchised. I mean, where is the Republican Party? It doesn't seem to me that it knows what it is anymore. In the same way that the Conservative Party in Britain doesn't know what it is anymore. On both sides of the Atlantic, it seems to me, conservatism or conservatives have forgotten for many years what it is that they're supposed to be conserving. Now, again, it takes a completely different form. Uh, in America, the Republican Party is not the same as the Conservative Party. In, in Britain, the Conservative Party's uh, 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 existential uh, problems, as it were, have been masked by the whole furore and, and cataclysmic changes to do with Brexit and the fact that Boris Johnson you know, delivered Brexit. And consequently, uh, you know, people have forgiven him for virtually everything. Um, so this has masked what is basically a, a fundamental problem uh, in the Conservative Party in Britain, in the Republican Party in America, in conservatism generally. They don't know what they're conserving anymore. They've kind of lost the plot. They've become convinced that, you know, these, 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 these cultural changes which are so fundamentally anti the West are A, irreversible, and B, not bad. And C, some of them have signed up for it. Like, you know, you say, you know, plenty of people of that kind are supporting Black Lives Matter. Um, and a similar thing is happening uh, in Britain. So... Um, the whole situation has become very confused. Um, it's, it's, it's a titanic battle, as I said. Um, at the moment, it doesn't look very promising uh, for those of us who want to um, defend and retain uh, traditional Western culture and values. Um, but having said that, there are millions and millions of people in Britain and in America um, who get it, just like you and I get it. Um, uh, and so where that's going to go, we, we don't know. It's a very dangerous situation, particularly in America, which is, I think, I don't wish to give offence, but it is, seems to be an inherently more violent, more revolutionary society uh, than Britain. And I think America's never stopped being a revolutionary society. And that's another, another, another discussion, perhaps, for another time. But, um, you know, the danger is, you know, some sort of low rumbling civil war. Um, and it seems more acute in America than it is in Britain, but it's, it's you know, it's, it's, it's not a million miles away uh, from the surface in Britain. Um, and it's what the British government's been so frightened about when it comes to uh, its Muslim community and the wilder elements within that. So um, who knows how this is going to, how this is going to end um, uh, or, or progress? I fear that, you know, we're in for quite a long time of heavy cultural attrition unless the people who are basically on the right side get it together and unless they find the leadership, the moral and political leadership and the courage to stand up against this. Because, you know, working together, we can all stand up against it and defeat it. The problem is that you need leadership to do that. At the moment, uh, I can't see where that leadership's coming from. Well, I think, Melanie, I think you've defined the issues, you know, very well. Uh, we are in a cataclysmic culture war for the future of the West. And what we've seen um, is certainly within the last several weeks is how intimately connected that is to Jewish safety and um, the survival of Israel and the safety and uh, Jewish uh, survival elsewhere. Um, these are issues we're going to be returning to as we keep covering them. And I think... Um, you know, we look to you for for you know every week in JNS for uh, insight on this on this and and other important issues, and we'll be discussing this in much greater detail as we go along. And I hope you'll come back uh, on to our podcast soon and uh, keep the discussion going. So thank you very much for for uh, for this and uh, for all that you do uh, in your writing. Thank you very much, Jonathan, for your time this evening and for hosting me on JNS, uh, which is a great privilege and honour. 
Um, and uh, let's hope we'll talk about something more cheerful next time. <laughs> well, perhaps not. I don't think we're in the happiness business. We are in the awareness business. We are in the business of making people, uh, waking people up to what the, the real issues are. But uh, we try to do so without taking ourselves too seriously. But thanks. Thanks so much. I hope you enjoyed this week's episode brought to you by the Jewish News Syndicate, JNS.org. Visit us at JNS.org and please follow at Amazon and Spotify wherever you listen to podcasts.